one right out of the bat, right out of the gate was that uh, he flew in yesterday morning and he landed at 8:30 a.m. Which, for a three-hour difference, you know what time he left very early at the crack of dawn on Tor in Toronto that morning, and he landed in Vancouver and made his way to the hotel and then he wandered around Granville Island and he made his way to the Improv Center and then sat outside the bench. I know. <laughs> right? He just hung out and very shortly improvisers came by. He had a lovely conversation with Mary and a bunch of other people and they started to jam and I tell you that's the kind of guy he is. He is kind and smart and funny as hell, and I was very lucky to uh, work on the documentary called uh, Act Social with Colin Mockery, and we did a little gig at Microsoft together, and that uh, project was where Colin and I co-hosted this interview show with leaders in the tech sector. Um, I play the uh, it's sort of technology for good, and I play the host that is like this positive Pollyanna, you know, type, and he played the curmudgeon groomer who does not know what the cloud is, <laughs> and he killed us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I received only one director's note from that entire day of filming, and finally the director said to me, Nancy, we're going to need you to not laugh at everything Colin says. <laughs> but oh no, I'm like, oh my god, it's Colin Bunker. <laughs> I am, I am a huge fan. And so in the spirit of AIM, I'm throwing some interview questions out of the window. We're going to get a little bit of background information. We're going to have a few questions that I will ask of Colin, and then you do it. You share and ask him anything. He, you want because he told me there's no topic off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, let's start at the beginning. All right. Talk about uh, talk about your discovery of improvisation. I um, was in a theater school, uh, Studio Fifty Eight. There's a couple of Studio Fifty Eight uh, people here tonight. And um, a friend of mine was doing a play reading at the Waterfront Theater, just mm -hmm. over there. And part of the evening was this thing called theater sports that this guy in Calgary had come up with. Um, so I, I saw it and I thought, oh, this is something that looks like it would be fun to do. And then a couple of months later, they started a, a theater sports league. And there used to be a theater uh, called City Stage on Thurlow, and it was beside McDonald's. And <laughs> Ray Michael, who was the, um, who owned the theater, very kindly said, you guys can have Fridays and Saturdays after the main show. So the first little while, it was us running into McDonald's, going, hey, come see our show. <laughs> and they would say, what's it about? And we go, we don't know. <laughs> you have to yell things at us, and then we'll make stuff up. And then within the year, there were lineups around the block, and it became the big thing to do in Vancouver. And then we started doing, um, we did a, uh, an improvised Hamlet. We did a, an improvised um, murder mystery called Suspect that was very popular. And it just kept uh, growing, and I actually made more money <laughs> from that than I did from anything else, um, which is unusual. <laughs> so, uh, so that was good. And then it just sort of, and then from that, I, I got theater uh, for some reason. And, um, and then Expo happened, and I, I was doing 11 shows during Expo. Uh, there were a couple of improv shows, a couple of scripted shows, and then I, um, my good friend uh, Ryan Stiles was doing, had been hired. Don't applaud him! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, one good guy. Um, he had been hired by Second City. Well, we auditioned together for Second City. There was three of us. They hired the other two guys. <laughs> Whatever. Um, 
So, um, so Ryan um, did it, and he was also uh, Patrick McKenna, uh, who uh, from the Red Green Show was also in that company. Gary Jones, who still improvises in town. So, um, of course, because uh, they thought he was funny, um, they brought him back to Toronto to be on the main stage. And my girlfriend and I, at that point, uh, had moved out to Toronto because I wanted, I was feeling comfortable in Vancouver. And I, I thought that was a bad thing for me. So I thought, hey, why don't I go somewhere where I don't know anybody and start again? <laughs> I mean, I was young. So, um, so we went out and um, Ryan called me uh, a couple of months into my um, residency there and he said, you know, they're looking for someone for the touring company. I mentioned you come in and audition. So I did. And so I got hired. Um, by the woman who later became my wife. Um, it was a difficult audition. <laughs> it involved cleaning uh, and something else. Um, so, um, so there was that. And then at one point, um, I was doing a show there, and um, we were told that these producers from a show in Britain called Whose Line Is It Anyway? We're doing a, a cross-country tour. So they came and saw the show, they loved the show, they asked us to audition at eight in the morning. <laughs> now, when you're in Second City, mornings are not your friend. Because you, uh, you do the shows, then you do an improv set, and then you kind of decompress afterwards. And so, you know, four o'clock would be the usual time you'd uh, get to bed. So we all um, audition. But because we auditioned as a uh, company, everybody was being nice. So everybody was being very supportive of everybody. So nobody stood out. So none of us got it. <laughs> yeah. Then the next year, uh, my wife, uh, Deb, and her writing partner, Linda Cash, um, written a show that was being produced in LA. So I went down with her because. Well, she was pregnant <laughs> seven months at the time, so I thought, mm, might as well. So we went down, and uh, they came through again, and I was auditioning with people I didn't know, and it was, hey, screw you, look at me. So, <laughs> this is a lesson for the kids out there. <laughs> I know it's an ensemble uh, art form, but, you know, at times. Um, so I got it, and then, um, my daughter was born, she was two months old, I went to Britain, did a show, I sucked, I came back, and then the next year they decided to shoot in New York because the show was big with college students on the comedy network, which at that point was called Ha. <laughs> I mean, not even Ha Ha, it was just Ha. Um, so Ryan talked them into uh, using me again. Um, when I came back, they put me with Ryan. And you know, we'd worked together for 10 years before that, so of course we clicked, and then it was a slow, every year, for seven years, uh, they would bring me back and go, we're giving you one show. And then I would do all of them. But the next year, we're giving you one show, until the very last year we shot in Britain, where they said, yeah, we're giving you everything. For seven years. Yeah, they weren't sure. <laughs> um, and then it went, to America. The um, British producers had always wanted to do an American version because of money, apparently. <laughs> Although, I gotta say, never saw much of that, but still. Um, they went, I think first they were associated with Paramount, and they wanted Jenny McCarthy to host. And they wanted young, good-looking improvisers. And uh, Dan said, it works with the ugly guys. <laughs> so, uh, so at that point, uh, Ryan was doing the Drew Carey show, and Drew was a, um, a fan of the show, and um, he told Drew, you know, they're looking for someone to, and Drew was big at ABC at that point. So he got involved, and then immediately, um, we had a summer series, it did really well, then they put us after Drew's show, it did incredibly well, then someone realized how cheap the show was. It's, it, I mean, it was the cheapest show in television history. You know, Friends were getting like, you know, a million dollars an episode. Yeah. Our show cost one friend. 
<laughs> for the entire life. Um, so they, once they found out how cheap we were, they put us up against, I don't know if you've heard of these shows, Survivor and Friends. <laughs> so um, we were killed every week in the ratings, yeah. but because the show was still cheap, we still made Warner Brothers money. Right. So it went on for a while, and then it didn't. And then it came back, and uh, that's where we're at now. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a rumor that uh, Who's Line has just finished taping its very last season, but now that may or may not... Here's the thing. I constantly am reminded I should not be on social media. Because <laughs> um, when we came back when Aisha was hosting, Ryan had done an interview in um, some Washington paper saying, oh, we're coming back. Aisha, Tyler's going to host. So I thought it was common knowledge. So I tweeted, hey everyone, whose line's coming back? Uh, more details later. <laughs> then it went, I believe, what the kids call viral. And I was getting calls from the coast saying, it was just, you're not supposed to say anything. I said, yeah. but Ryan said something. He said, oh, nobody listens to Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> and then on this one, I, I said, this is the last show we're doing of Who's Life. And I got calls again. It's like, Nobody knows that, and I thought, I thought we had discussed this. <laughs> and now the CW is a non-scripted um, network, so uh, who knows what's going to happen. It really is like The Walking Dead at this point. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot kill this show as much as we try. So. 30 years, 400 episodes. <laughs> And yet beyond that, in a very interesting, almost sociological way, you introduce improv to society, right? How many, when Colin and I were doing a quick little waiting for our dinner, how many people who talked to Colin said, I grew up watching this one? So many, right? And I, and, um, and apparently there are, it is one of the highest groups in YouTube, like it just, I, anybody else other than me, like watch Who's Line reruns on YouTube, like it's just amazing, right? And the audience is getting younger. Uh, that's why it came back. Um, right. Brad Sherwood and I, uh, Brad's on the show also. No, don't yeah. applaud him either. <laughs> I will tell you who you can applaud. <laughs> um, yeah, so Brad and I have been touring for 20 years and we saw um, about, uh, I guess, 12 years ago, our audiences were getting younger, which doesn't happen for touring um, shows. And we realized it was because of YouTube. These kids who weren't born uh, during the, the run of the show were catching up with it on uh, Who's Line. So that's why the CW, a network who's really, the rest of the casts of every show could be our children. <laughs> we're that old and they were that young. Uh, so the CW picked it up, and uh, so that was, was great. So it's, it's I'm, um, I know there was, um, well, not, it wasn't backlash, but I know there were improv purists who weren't quite happy with the show, and I, I understand it. It's because, you know, it's jokey, it's uh, jokey, it's jokey. <laughs> <laughs> but because of the constraints of television, it had to be. It, Everything had to be two to three minutes long. And it's hard to do. Um, so I always said, you know, uh, Whose Line is sort of the vaudeville of improv. It sort of shows you what it is, basically, and then it's up to you to go out and find other kinds of improv that take it in a different direction, long form, or whatever. Right. So I'm, I'm very happy that we sort of introduced it. I'm really proud that um, families could watch it, even though some stuff is suspect. <laughs> um, but, you know, I would often get people saying, you know, our family, it was the one show our family would watch together, then we would play games afterwards, and um, so, so I'm proud of the legacy of uh, what Who's Line did and what it sort of got started. 
Indeed. And, and when we were out uh, last night with friends and people recognized Colin in Granville Island, there were people who, you know, greeted him in a different way. You know, oh, you made me laugh. Right? You know, that, that we had that connection. And, and um, there, is, there is just such a gratitude for that, uh, that spirit and the purity of, of uh, what Who's Line brought. Sure. And I mean, and I'm, this is absolutely, it's been proven. I'm adorable. <laughs> There has been scientific studies. Um, what I, I, I think what was great about the show, um, and what's great about when people come up and talk to us, they truly feel like they know us because we were not playing characters. We were slightly exaggerated, hopefully, um, um, images of ourselves. So people, um, especially young people who grew up with us, really felt like we were part of the family. So it's really not like, um, we played serial killers and people who weren't afraid of us. So it was, people always felt very relaxed talking to us, which was nice. Right. Well, you know, you said uh, we did the vaudeville of improv and then opened the doors for many and so that other people can bring improv and teach improv and the tools and techniques to do a lot of other things. And Colin, that is what we all here in this room are on a mission to do. Yeah. Um, so, friends, what else? Yes, Aunt, what do you want to ask this adorable icon? What was your worst show? What was your I'll worst tell you when it show? happens. <laughs> nice. Nice. So not true. <laughs> I'll tell you the worst show. Ryan, Brad, and I did a show at the Laugh Factory in, in, in Los Angeles. And uh, I think we were, everyone was given 20 minutes. First 10 minutes, we didn't get one laugh. But we thought, we're gonna keep going until that happens. <laughs> Around minute 25, we thought, I think it's going to happen soon. <laughs> we kept going, nothing. We left to silence. We walked out of the theater. Each of us went to our cars, drove home, and didn't talk to each other for two weeks. <laughs> and then, uh, not that we were blaming each other, it's just that it was so fresh yeah. and horrible. Yeah. Um, but also, there's something about it that makes you feel so alive. <laughs> I mean, you are so aware of everything. You can hear everyone breathe. You can hear your heart beat. You can feel every beat of sweat that's going down your back. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think you need those times because it certainly keeps you humble. And it, you know, it's, it's when you get back on that horse and ride it, it you know, you're, you're much more respectful of, oh yeah, it, it's work in many ways. Indeed. So, uh, how many people here have heard of Hiprov? Right? An amazing, an amazing show. And many of you here have seen the TED Talk called Your Brain on Improv. And when we produced the documentary called Act Social, we substantiated the uh, scientific work of Dr. Charles Lynn. He was the neuroscientist and musician who put individuals through a functional MRI machine to look at what is happening uh, in a, a brain scan, what is happening when we are in a state of creativity, spontaneity, improvisation. And uh, he found two things. The part of the brain that is suppressed is the lateral prefrontal cortex. That's the part of the brain that is responsible for self-monitoring. You know, that guardedness that we feel, don't do this, right? Uh, the part of the brain that is activated, that gets the blood and the oxygen, is the medial prefrontal cortex. That's the part of the brain that is responsible for self-expression. And we all know that feeling of freedom and connection and playful mindfulness and presence that is magical and that comes alive. 
Interestingly, that same neurological event, that happening, happens in Colin's show. So talk to us a little bit about that show, how that got started, how you actually sure. brought, that, brought that to the stage. Yeah. Uh, how many people have improvised in an MRI? <laughs> Okay. Um, I spent an hour and a half in an MRI improvising while uh, Dr. Lim uh, checked out my brain. <laughs> and um, everything Nancy says is true. What happens, um, Asad Meki, the hypnotist, was taking classes at Second City. And he realized what the instructors were telling him to do you know, get out of your head, just do uh, sub sort of subconscious comedy. He realized that that's what I do in my act. So he thought, I wonder if I work with an improviser and we hypnotize normal people, um, whether that would work. So he contacted uh, my agent and then we met and I thought, hey, this sounds insane. <laughs> so let's do it. So um, we kind of got together, and it's one of those things that you can't rehearse. Uh, so we kind of talked about it, and then Second City was kind enough to um, let us uh, come in after a show. And then, as we're walking on, I asked Asad a question. I should have asked him weeks before. <laughs> I said, oh, hey, if I ask them to do this, will they do it? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> he said it depends on the subject. Some will immediately, some will just seem really stoned, and some just will not respond at all. I went, okay. And then we went out and did the show. And um, it, went, it went well. And from that time to where we are now, it's sort of like going from Pong to Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> um, the games we were doing originally were very simple games, and now I'm doing, I, I learned through this because I thought I'm, it's just going to be traffic control for me. It's just I'm going to have to sort of do everything. But it wasn't that way. It was like they were real improvisers in that they react immediately to everything Assad and I gave them, which is great. The downside is they don't have a game plan. They're not going, hey, I'll say this so we can head in this direction. They say, I'm done. <laughs> this, they are truly in the moment. This, that's as far as they're going. So it makes it very interesting for me trying to find a way to keep the narrative going. But it's been, um, it's been so exciting to work with people I don't know who are in a trance. And everything I thought I knew about hypnotism, I realized I got from the Flintstones. It was, it's wrong. Um, they're aware the, the entire time. And when we started doing it, I would talk to them afterwards and say, so do you remember what you were doing? And they said, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I remember everything. It's just everything you said sounded like such a great idea, I just went with it. And I thought, man, I could use that. <laughs> um, and then there were some people, there was one guy who said, you know, I, I wasn't really hypnotized, uh, but I didn't want to ruin the show, so I just went along with it. And I said, oh, because in the scene where you proposed to me and started kissing me, you really seemed into it. And he went, what? <laughs> So it's, um, it's been fast. What I love about it is they give suggestion or they, they give you things that you, you can't predict. You know, when I'm working with Ryan and, and Brad and Wayne, even though we're improvising, I have a general feeling of where they're going to go and what's going to happen with the scene. With these people, no. Um, we were doing a scene where I'm a superhero. I'm looking for a sidekick. So I got from the audience uh, the Gibraltar kid. So he comes out, I go, oh, so you're the Gibraltar kid? Uh, so what's your superpower? Are you, do you become strong like a rock? Do you harden? He goes, no, 
I have residency in Gibraltar. <laughs> so, uh, I said, what? He said, well, anything happens in Gibraltar, I take care of it. And I said, well, I'm, I'm based in North America. He said, I can't work there. I don't have papers. And so it became this whole scene about how to get him so, someone to allow him to come to America to help fight crime with me. So, and then there was one woman who's, I said, what's your superpower? She said, delayed gratification. And I thought, <laughs> and so I, there's that moment where you go, okay, I mean, they're in a trance. I don't want this to get weird. I don't want, so I thought, I'll just let that go. And I, I said, oh, interesting. So I said, so if, say someone is robbing a bank, what happens? She goes, well, I go up to the bank, but I don't go in right away. <laughs> it, was like, it was just, it was just amazing stuff that was just totally out of nowhere and bizarre, and gave me a lot to work with. And uh, yeah, I, I just love it. So fun. we're coming to the Vogue uh, November 17th, yeah. I think. So yeah. thanks, Cookie. Yeah, lots of tour dates uh, online. We were lucky to be there for your off-Broadway sold out mm -hmm. in New York. It's now going for a pretty heavy run in Vegas. You're in Vegas. Yeah. Different. <laughs> yeah, it's, Vegas is different. It's, uh, for one thing, it was 140 degrees last week. Yeah. That's hot. That is hot. That's hot. Yeah. All right, uh, as Colin and I sit here beside two ferns, <laughs> Um, I invite you to ask, come up and come, please. All right, so we spoke about your brain is on improv and what it does to you. And yes. Okay, let me, if I may, um, brain uh, neuroplasticity, you know, if, if Colin has achieved this, uh, this ability to have through, through improv, uh, a suppressed lateral prefrontal and, a, and the self-expression, he has built those neurons and from plasticity, what is the effect of living this way, living in a constantly creative improvisational mindset? Great. I'm glad yes. we got to the fluff questions right away. <laughs> <laughs> About 15 years ago, my wife and I had a discussion over wine, as we usually do, and we thought, why don't we use the rules of improv in our life? So why don't we say yes and to things that may be a little outside of our comfort zone, maybe things we're not quite sure about, and see where it takes us. The next day, we get a call from World Vision saying, we want you to go to the Congo. <gasps> not one of our vacation <laughs> destinations. But we, uh, we were invested in this, so we said yes. So they sent us forms saying, if you get kidnapped, we will not negotiate. <laughs> That made you think a little, but we thought, no, we said, yes, and. So we signed them, um, we went to the Congo, and this was right after Christmas, and it was one of the greatest experiences um, of our life. We were there to uh, showcase certain children to get foster, um, to get sponsored. So uh, we would drive into the jungle every day, and um, you know we had that sign on our van that said we had no guns, which I thought was isn't that kind of. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was so worried that was my penis. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's happened before. <laughs> um, so we went into the jungle and we met these people. Um, in incredible poverty. And we had just come from a North American Christmas, which wow. was just right. uh, insane. So, and, but these people had this incredible spirit. Uh, 
Remember Deb um, by the river with all the kids doing the... <laughs> no one saw that. Uh, Deb doing the hokey pokey with all the kids. And um, we had a soccer ball and we were playing with the kid. And it was just, it was amazing. Uh, meeting, them, meeting this little girl uh, who we ended up sponsoring her because she was um, uh, she was 10 and the fear was her grandmother was going to die and when she did they were going to marry her off to um, someone in a neighboring village so <laughs> Don't worry, it's not what you said. No, I didn't blame. Good thing you don't need tape. Yeah. <laughs> Security is <isn't> good. Yeah. <laughs> um, a ten year old. Yeah. So a ten year old, and she's and she was saying, and she uh, she spoke French. So she was saying, mm -hmm. you know, I am too young to be married. I want to be a nurse. Yeah. You know, she showed us her doll, which was a clothes peg half a clothes peg that she painted face on. Uh, and so it was heartbreaking, but also, I don't know, it was just an enlightening. It was one of the best uh, journeys we had. And uh, we met a lot of incredible people, and people from World Vision were amazing. One guy had a fart machine <laughs> that just brought so much joy to the, it's amazing how international a fart is. It's just, Amazing. So, uh, so from that, um, Deb and I decided we would we do that more. We also uh, tried to listen more to each other because many times we'd have arguments and then halfway through realized we were on the same side, <laughs> but somehow we had gotten uh, screwed up. And then when our daughter, um, uh, our son transitioned to our daughter. Um, that also really helped, I think, having an improv background and being able to um, accept and support. Um, so, uh, I mean, I can't, I can't tell you how fortunate I've been in my life that truly, and I'm, I, I'm really, I'm, I'm not being humble, there's only one thing I can do. And the fact that this show from England came and showcased that and gave me a career, I'm working, I'm making a living doing something that didn't exist when I was a kid. So I've been incredibly fortunate and it's gotten me to all of these uh, amazing places, meeting these incredible people around the world. And it also, it's enriched my life because it's helped me I mean, I still have a ways to go in certain areas, uh, but I feel like it's really helped me uh, connect to people because I was very shy, very introverted, and through the success of Who's Line and through improv, it's really helped me make a connection, able to make a connection quickly with people outside of you know being the incredible star I am. Um, so. Improv has been really important in my life in so many ways. Uh, it, I, it's enriched my relationship with my wife, with my daughter, with my friends. Um, so, it's, and I'm constantly telling people, take improv classes. Right. You don't have to go into uh, improv as a, you know, as a job, but it will make you a better person, a better listener, a better teammate, a better workmate, a better partner. There's no way you will lose anything by taking an improv class. It will do yes. nothing. Yes. Yes. I'm, so, uh, I'm so grateful you mentioned Kinley. But back when uh, when uh, your daughter was transitioning, there was a little bit of hate back to Colin on Twitter, and he tweeted out, "Look, if my 87-year-old mother can accept this, the rest of society should too." And then he, of course. And then you followed up with something like, she does call it the BLT community. Yeah. <laughs> she, you know, she had some learning to do. She had some learning to do. Yeah, stop the BLT, mom. Please stop saying it out loud. 
But the connections made are real, and the, and the, uh, the formative relationships and how we are open and listening. And, you know, is there anything that you continue to work on as you unlearn? Is there, are there things that you feel you need to do? No, I'm done. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, there's, all, there's always something. I mean, as often as, you know, I've been, oh, doing this 43 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there's never a point walking out on stage where I think, all right, it's all gonna be great. It's uh, constantly reminding myself and being in the moment, uh, not planning, I am concentrating my partner, I'm here to make him look good, or her, or them, and we're here to have fun. Uh, and there are some times where uh, I forget that. Uh, so I, I'm constantly reminding myself that also, um, it isn't hard, really. It's this, it's, I mean, it's what we all do in our, our lives. We improvise our lives, and our lives can be as hard as we make it. I mean, obviously there's outside influences that can also right. take care of that. But, when you're improvising on stage, there should be nothing except the audience and the people you're working with. And the audience is also such a, a major part of the whole experience because they're giving you ideas. They, you can feel their energy when they, they so want you to do well with something that yeah. you, you've given them. And they sort of dictate also how the show goes. It's like, okay, they're not going for this. Let's go this way. And, um, we were doing Zoom shows yeah. uh, during you know that time, and um, and it was great in a way. We had a great uh, technical team. So Brad was in Vegas, I was in Toronto. We were in our basements. We had these green screens, and we, we could actually do things that we couldn't do on stage. Yeah. And we were able to go actually into people's houses and talk to them. But we were doing a show to silence which Brad is totally used to. But, <laughs> a little a bit of a learning curve for me. So, um, so it was also nice to remind me how important the audience is and how they react, how important it is to the success of the show. Absolutely, absolutely. More questions? Yes, sir. Um, a moment ago you mentioned your penis. Um, <laughs> a moment ago you mentioned to, your penis. Yes. How is it to work with TV uh, censorship? Television censorship. When we the um, did the show in Britain, you could pretty much do anything. <laughs> People were screwing the Queen, there were uh, F-bombs. When we came to America, it was different. Um, they decided, because there wasn't a script for them to see, they put a censor in the booth uh, to watch the show. So there was one scene where I was supposed to be in love with Greg Cruz. So towards the end of the scene, I kissed him. A voice comes over the intercom going, can you make something else up? <laughs> In the scene previously, I'd killed three women and thrown them out a window. That was fine. <laughs> I mean, it was funny. Um, so, the unfortunate thing, or the fortunate thing, was uh, Drew, who was hosting the show, has a real button about censorship. Right. So the next ten minutes was unusable, as he <laughs> would introduce, now we're going to play motherfucking uh, greatest hits. <laughs> So, um, they came to an agreement, the producer and the censor. We would do the show, and then after the show, they would have a meeting and talk about blah, blah, blah. So there was one time after a show, Dan Patterson, the uh, producer, comes, came up to me and said, Hello, oh, good news. We lost two pussies, but we got a penis. <laughs> Okay, and it was weird, I mean, it was odd because we never knew where the line was. I mean, obviously we knew we had to get a show out, so we weren't going to do uh, you know, bad language, but they would, there was one 
hoedown that uh, Ryan did, and they bleeped out him saying hand. But the audience made assumptions a thousand times worse <laughs> than that word. So um, they seemed pretty upset with any sort of same-sex love or, uh, well, any kind of sexual thing, really. Um, which violence was, was all right. Violence was great. <laughs> um, the audience, however, the audi audiences get so upset when you kill a mime animal. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, and you have to go, it's, I just, yes, I broke the neck of a kitten, but it was, there was nothing there, it was fake. I punted a baby, nothing. <laughs> so, I don't know. We had a question in the back, yes, uh, by the post. I, uh, I mean, I, obviously, I think it's great. I think just from an entertainment value with improv, the how it's expanded into different um, long forms and uh, you know, improvised one act plays, Dungeons and Dragons, having it um, apply to other occupations, other fields of interest, I think can only help the world. Right. Um, I, I know it's you know. Oh yeah, I'm going to get controversial. Um, <laughs> and you know, you know uh, things like science, I think, they tend to improvise more. They're constantly um, trying different things. That's right. Um, I think in government, we need a little more <laughs> improv, like maybe embracing failure. Definitely using the improv skill of listening is something that I think should be mandatory if you're going to run for any kind of office. Um, when you watch these panel shows and you just see people, just like everybody talking over each other, it's like, well, how is anything going to be? Listen. And of course, you're going to disagree with times, but sometimes you may surprise yourself and find yourself agreeing. Um, my father-in-law, one of the loveliest men I've ever known, was a Reagan Republican. And we would have discussions at times about politics, but and it was always respectful. And he he knew I would I was never going to turn into a conservative, and I knew he would never become a liberal. Although he had many liberal, um, he had many liberal qualities. Like he wrote poetry. No, <laughs> <laughs> I, no, but he was he was. Um, heavily invested in the arts. He, okay. he would do extra work, he painted, um, he was um, a, just a lovely guy. And so we would listen to each other. And there were times he would make points, and i go, okay, that makes sense. Financially conservative, being financially conservative, right. I can see, absolutely. So, um, but I feel, especially now, it's, it, it's incredibly weird. It's just, nobody's listening to each other. And the fact that if you're with the other guys, you're a traitor to the country right. is, um, it, it's upsetting. And I feel, well, I don't know what, I don't know, I mean, I certainly don't know how to fix that, but somehow they have to find a way to just step back a bit, take a breath, and listen to each other. Certainly, you can still disagree, but maybe there's a way you can come to some sort of a middle and maybe think about the country that you're supposed to be serving as opposed to the party that you're serving. Absolutely. Okay. We had a wonderful plenary by a man named David Diamond, and, and my business mentor likes to remind me that listening is a sacrificial act. That the contract, the, the, pay, the, the payment of attention, and that it is uh, allowing myself to be changed as a result of what I just heard. I saw a hand. Hello. Oh, Nick, right? Yeah. Uh, I saw the last one laughing. Yeah. The show. Um, I was just wondering how hard it is to not get that feedback of all the fellow comedians 
Yeah. Not laughing at you. Yeah. But it, it sounds the most difficult thing ever. That was horrific. <laughs> that was horrific. Uh, for those of you who don't know, there was a show called uh, Last, Last One Laughing. Night. And it's 10 comedians in a room for six hours. And the last one not to laugh wins. Um, the weird thing is, we all kind of knew each other. I, I would say I knew everyone. May, Martin, we were Twitter pals, and that was the first time I had met them. And John from Montreal, uh, that was the first time I met him. So usually when you get together with comedians, it's like you talk about your horrible gigs <laughs> and all the horrible things that is being in the world of comedy, and everyone's laughing. So immediately you have to think, oh no, that isn't it. Um, two of the participants, Deborah DiGiovanni, a, a great stand-up, and Carolyn Ray, I said to them, you're not going to make it past the intros because they love people and laugh at people all the time. And sure enough, they were gone. Like, I think Carolyn actually committed humor suicide. She broke herself up twice. <laughs> um, so it was, I think most of the people who ended up getting a mark against them, they did it themselves. I know, because I forgot, I forgot halfway through what the rules were, that you're not supposed to laugh. And we were having lunch, so I thought, oh, we're on a lunch break. And apparently we weren't. So um, <laughs> that's when I got my, you were allowed two dings. Right. Um, so it was very hard to concentrate, especially when it got towards the end. And I, I was pretty drunk. <laughs> there was a working bar, and uh, it ended up there was two of us, and there were shots happening. And as the clock was ticking down, I thought, oh, we got five minutes. I, I've used all my best stuff. <laughs> uh, so it was, it was great in that it was a great mental exercise to keep in the game, um, but it was also horrible in that you weren't allowed to laugh at people who make a living being funny. And there was some really funny stuff that I couldn't laugh at. And I felt that, and so afterwards, I'll be cool. you know, that thing you did, that was really funny. Really but you know, the rules of the game, I couldn't laugh at you otherwise. <laughs> Colin won that show, and with his sizable winnings, donated it to a trans camp, northern Ontario. Yeah, there's a camp called the uh, Rainbow, Rainbow, where uh, it's all for that community. Yeah. Yeah. Can, I go, can I do one more question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, one more. Uh, the gentleman right there. Hi. I'm curious uh, if you've had uh, stories or moments where your perspective on improv has sort of changed or something where like you started started thinking about it differently or approaching it differently over the course of your career. Um I had a moment um, a moment for me that sort of changed my outlook was the very first whose line I talked about when I did in Britain, when I, I, I sucked the air out of the room. <laughs> I, because I psyched myself out, thinking, oh, I'm in a different country, even though we speak the same language, will I get my reference, blah, 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 blah. So I didn't do anything. Um, so I was really tentative and um, not memorable at all, and just was bad. And from that moment, I thought, why did I do that? And um, I sort of made a conscious decision to go for it every time. Even if I had nothing, just to totally commit and do something. So even if it wasn't working for me, it would work for the people I was um, working with. So that was one lesson. Another lesson was Ryan Stiles, don't clap. <laughs> um, Ryan uh, was a stand-up. Not the best. I mean, he's, his two main jokes, one was about Dolly Parton, and one was about a low-budget zoo that had a picture of a giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was not where he was going to make his money. Uh, but most of it, act, he would just kind of improvise with audience members and talk to them. But uh, when we worked together, from the very beginning, and sometimes I have improvised with other 
uh, stand-ups, and they have it hasn't been great because they're used to being the, the one person on stage. So they're, they're not always, and that's a sweeping generalization. Greg Proops is also a stand-up, and he's also lovely to work with. But what I learned from Ryan was he took as much joy setting you up for a joke as he did getting the punchline. So if you if he set you up for something and you knew exactly where he was going for and you did it, it was like he had just given birth. <laughs> uh, he was just so happy for that moment. And so th for me, that was an important thing of, oh yeah, you don't have to come up with the killer line all right. the time. It is an ensemble thing. So building is, in fact, it's probably more important than getting that line. Because uh, a lot of people can easily come up with that killer line. But building it in the right way so it's just the perfect, where, the perfect log where you can just smash it back. It, that's a skill. So um, I can't believe how important Ryan Stiles has been in my life. He's taught me uh, a lot about improv. He got me a wife. Not sure about the kid. Um, no, she has a, a lovely nose. Uh, so, no, but uh, Ryan's being um, a, a very important part of my life and uh, a, a really good friend and uh, giving me so much, obviously. And so, um, so yeah, so the, those were the two main things. And now I'm so comfortable just walking out on stage um, and it's the only place where I am totally comfortable because I'm with people I trust I know what my role is in this little world that we have and it usually works out and even when it doesn't it's still a win and those are um, absolutes that I don't have in life so um, I, yeah, I'm very glad improv came into my life, and I'm, I'm glad with all the people that I've worked with, because they all teach me something. I mean, when I first started uh, doing improv, I would watch everyone who was better than me and go, okay, what are they doing? Right. And how can I steal that and make it my own so no one knows I've stolen it? And there were, what I loved, there were people who weren't in the arts. We had uh, an incredibly funny guy who was a cable installer. Uh, we did a playwright, and um, so, just reminding myself that I don't know everything and never will know everything and just soak up everything from the people I work with and uh, I can't lose. So I will turn it back over to Kirsten and we're going to see some improv. Um, I just realized, like everything I said doesn't really apply to what I do on stage. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you. I just want to say that last night I had the honor of having dessert with these two beautiful people. And Colin said that, uh, he said that improv was, I guess he said the vaudeville, vaudeville, but I thought he said the vodka. <laughs> yeah, it's the vodka. vodka. It's the vodka <laughs> improv. <laughs> you said that when you went to Britain that you just sucked and you, and you had no other skills. And so, uh, Vanessa Wilde, you may have seen with her lovely Were you there? Hat. You were at that show? <laughs> no. <laughs> she, uh, today, made these hats. And uh, we have for each of you the <gasps> Dare to Suck Hats. I love it! <laughs> There's nothing I look more than sucking. Be more perfect. Thank you for that. Awesome. And uh, oh, that's Thank you so much. I really you. appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you so much for coming all this way to come